Good afternoon. This lesson is going to focus on reactions in aqueous solution. We'll be focusing on using the activity series, determining the special types of double replacement reactions, and learning how to write net ionic equations. We'll begin our lesson focusing on single replacement reactions, where we would have A plus BC forming either AC plus B or BC plus A. We use the activity series to determine whether or not a reaction will occur. The activity series gives us a ranking of reactivities for the different elements. The way how it works is if you find an element that is by itself in the chemical reaction is higher on this list than the element that's already found in the compound that it would be switching places with, i.e. the two metals that would potentially switch places or the two nonmetals that would switch places. If the element by itself is higher on the list than the element that is already in the compound, then a reaction will take place. If the more active metal is already in the compound, then we would simply write no reaction for that particular reaction. The activity series will be given to you on any test that you will have. The basic concept of it is found by looking at the electrical potentials that they would have when basically creating a battery. That's where our work comes from experimentation wise for the activity series. When we look at a couple of examples here, you can see that we'd have some type of metal that we would place into some solution and we would create a new solution and a new metal. You can see in our first example that we have zinc plus the 10 2 plus ion that could most likely be like 10 nitrate in the solution. We're giving you an example of this as a net ionic equation here. Um, but you can look and you can see up at the top that zinc is higher on that list than 10 is. And because zinc is by itself initially, it will replace the 10 in the solution and we will form the metal 10 that would be precipitating out onto the zinc metal and you would see the little tree starting to form in this example on the left. On the right side, this is the reaction that we did in class. Hopefully that kind of looks a little bit familiar. We're taking some copper wire and we're placing it into some silver nitrate solution. So again, same type of thing. I look and I see I've got copper right here. I have silver right here. My copper is more reactive than the silver is, so it is going to replace the silver in the solution. And you can see on the wire here, all the silver ions are going to come in and plate around the copper as the copper ions go out into the solution. Notice the change. We get that slight blue color. That again is because of the copper two ions that are found in the solution. So again, as some of those metals uh, atoms for the copper are being dissolved into the solution they're being replaced by the silver metal atoms that form on the wire so we're now going to look at a few example problems here the first thing that you need to do is pause the video and go and check your metals on the activity series to find out whether or not the element that is by itself is more active again if it is more active then the reaction will occur if it is not as reactive, then we would just write NR for no reaction. So if we look at the first one, we have zinc as a solid plus the silver nitrate solution. If you go and look, zinc is higher on the list than the silver nitrate, so we know a reaction will occur. So just kind of thinking along the lines of our reaction types, I have my AB plus C. The C is a metal, so it's gonna switch places with the silver. So I'm gonna write down my ions. Zinc off your periodic table, always 2 plus. Silver from your periodic table, always a 1 plus. And the nitrate, which you've hopefully memorized by now, is NO3 with a 1 minus charge. So now I would have C and B coming together. So I would have Zn, NO3, parentheses 2, 2 plus, 1 minus. And then I would have the silver metal that would form as well. The zinc chlor uh, nitrate excuse me, would be aqueous. The silver would be a solid, and now we need to balance it. So you'll notice I have one NO3 on my reactant side for the silver nitrate. I have two for the zinc nitrate. So I'm going to start by placing a two here for that coefficient, and now I have two silvers as well. So I'm going to have a two 
for the silver as the product. So we can now move on to our second. Pause the video again, check your activity series. Aluminum should be higher on the list than the zinc, so we will have a reaction take place. So same type of thing, my two metals still following under the same exact format where I have the CB plus A. So now I need my ions. So I'm going to have AL with a three plus charge, the zinc again two plus, and the chloride ion one minus. So now predicting my products, I know that I'll have the aluminum switching place of the zinc, so I'd have zinc metal and I would have aluminum chloride. Three plus, one minus, that's going to give me AlCl3, and then I would have the zinc that would be left over. Again, from our last video, please remember that the elements when they are created, they're not part of a compound, so they have no charge. They would be zero for their oxidation number. So I'd have this as a solid, I would have this as an aqueous for that solution. And now for balancing, I have three chlorines on the product side, I have two for the reactant, so I need to have a three for the zinc chloride and a two for the AlCl3, for the aluminum chloride. So that would mean that I would have two for my aluminums and three for my zincs. And finally, our last reaction, I have silver plus aluminum nitrate. So we can infer because the first reaction here took place when silver was in the compound and zinc was the metal. And then the second one took place when zinc was in the compound and aluminum was the metal. Now, because the silver was less reactive than the zinc and the zinc was less reactive than the aluminum, we can make the inference that the silver would also be less reactive than the aluminum. And in this example, because of the fact that the silver is by itself, while the aluminum is already in the compound, we can therefore say because the aluminum is more reactive, that this will be no reaction. So now when we look at a special case scenario for these single replacement reactions, one of the very common reactions that we have is when we place a metal in an acid. So you'll have to remember acids are a little bit unique in the fact that the cation for the acid is coming from the H+. So remember we have a general form of HA for any acid. I have the hydrogen ion plus the anion for the acid. So when we place a metal, again a positively charged atom or ion, it's going to switch places with the hydrogen from the acid. So when we look at this, if you notice, some of the metals will be below hydrogen, but most of them are above hydrogen. So if hydrogen is higher on the list than the metal, no reaction would take place. If hydrogen is lower on the list than the metal, then a reaction will take place. The products of this reaction, you would always have a salt that would form between the metal and the anion, and then you would have hydrogen gas. So you can see here with the magnesium being placed into the acid solution, you'll have the bubbles that would get created where you will have the hydrogen gas forming. So as a general form, just the metal plus the acid, the aqueous solution here, that'll be a salt solution, and then I have the hydrogen gas. So if we look at this first example problem, again, magnesium is a more reactive metal than hydrogen. Again, checking your activity series. So now I'm going to form a compound between the magnesium and the chlorine. Magnesium on your periodic table, 2 plus, chloride 1 minus, and the hydrogen is the H plus. So I'd have Mg2 plus Cl minus, so I'd have MgCl2, and then I would have H2 gas. For balancing, I'd have a 2 for the HCl. This would now be aqueous again, and then the hydrogen would be a gas. As I look at my next example, aluminum plus hydrobromic acid, I'm going to have the aluminum being more reactive than the hydrogen is. So as a result of that, we would have a reaction take place. So for my ions, I would have Al3+, plus, H+, plus, and Br-. So I'd have Al3+, 
3 plus BR minus ALBR3, and then I would have H2 gas. For my balancing purposes, I would need 6 and 2 and 2 and 3. Okay, so we now have one last example problem for us here, and that is dealing with copper. So copper, you'll notice, is the first element below hydrogen on our activity series. So this should be a no reaction. The next example that we will look at is active metals being placed into water. So it's going to follow a very similar pattern as we had with the acids. For your active metals, we're going to focus mainly on your alkali and alkaline earth metals. And these are going to be metals that will actually react with water. So when we look at this, they would be able to replace the hydrogen and they're going to form a metal hydroxide. So they will form hydrogen gas plus the metal hydroxide in the solution. You saw the reaction between calcium and water and sodium in water earlier in the year when we were talking about properties for the families on the periodic table. So when we look at these, again, uh, the vast majority of them you're going to find will be producing the um, salts or the bases there with the hydroxides and then the hydrogen gas. So as we look at our first example, we would have again for our ions Ca2 plus, OH minus, and NH plus. So Ca2 plus, OH minus, that would give me a formula CaOH parentheses 2 plus the hydrogen gas. So now when I go to balance it, I would have a 2 in front of the water. As we look at our next example, I have K potassium plus the water. This one will be a very violent reaction. I have my ions again, K plus, OH minus, and H plus. So when I figure out my products, KOH, the two positives would switch places. So I would have, in this case, KOH and H2 gas. For the balancing, I'd have 2 and 2 and 2. If we look at our last example, now we would have iron plus water. In this case, iron is not considered one of those active metals that will react with water, so we would just simply have no reaction. In order to rust, iron also needs oxygen gas in addition to the water. So now we're going to look at our double replacement reactions. So for our double replacement reactions, we have a couple of different types that can take place where we have either a solid form, which we would call a precipitate, or we could have a gas that would form, or we could have water that would occur from a neutralization reaction between an acid and a base. So for some of your ionic compounds, usually for those with ions with low charges, they will dissolve in water to form ions. This all kind of goes back to Coulomb's law, if you recall, where we had Q1 times Q2 over D squared equals the force of attraction. The stronger the ions are, again, the larger the charge on the ion, the stronger the force of attraction will be between the ions and the more difficult it will be for water to separate them. But we do have some exceptions to that, even with the larger ions. But for the most part, the compounds that have the low charges will have enough of a force of attraction for the water to separate them into their individual ions, as you can see in the picture below. So when we have the compounds that have the larger charged ions present, they typically will not be able to be split apart by the water molecules and they will have a greater attraction for themselves than they do for the water. Therefore, those compounds will not dissolve in water and we classify those as being insoluble. Now, please understand, I always just say this because a lot of times you'll see people say insoluble cannot dissolve. That just means that there is a very, very small amount of the 
ions that will dissolve in the solution, but the vast majority of them would stay as a solid. When we have the reaction between two aqueous solutions and it produces the solid, we call that the precipitate. You guys saw an example of this in class the other day when we were reacting the potassium iodide and the lead 2 nitrate. You can see, just like you did in the video that we're doing, the lead 2 iodide that would form gives you that nice, pretty yellow precipitate. And then the potassium nitrate would be a clear solution for what remains. In order to determine the substance that is actually forming the precipitate, we need to use something that we call the solubility rules. So the solubility rules are a list of rules that we can follow that will allow us to identify whether or not a compound is soluble or insoluble within a given reaction. So if it tells us that it is soluble, then it is aqueous in the solution, and that will tell us that the compound will dissolve in water and you will find ions in solution. We're going to talk more about this in just a few minutes, but that is a process that we call dissociation. If you have an insoluble compound, that means that the compound does not dissolve in water and will remain as a solid. But again, I want to add in here to a great extent. So when we talk about that, you may find that 0.1 grams out of 100 grams of that solid would dissolve, but the other 99.9 .9 grams would stay as a solid. So there's just a small, tiny little bit that will dissolve. There's an entire branch of chemistry that deals just with this specific scenario that you're about to learn. So how we look at the information for the solubility rules is pretty simple. You just want to focus on what metals are present within the compound and are mixing with a specific anion or nonmetal. So for your list of rules, you have a couple of compounds that will form that will always 100% of the time be soluble. So anytime that you have your alkali metals, so lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, and also the ammonium ion, those will always be soluble. No matter what they're mixed with, they will always be soluble. Your acetates, your nitrates, your chlorates, and your perchlorates will also always be soluble. For your halides, and this will be your non-fluorine type of halides, uh, so we're talking about the halogens minus fluorine, we don't focus on fluorine, it goes under its own set of unique rules because it's smaller radius compared to oxygen, greater electronegativity compared to oxygen. So it's going to have some different dynamics that come into play when we're talking about the dissolving process for the fluorides. But your chlorides, bromides, iodides, they will all be soluble except when they are combined with either silver, the mercury one ion, the mercury two ion, copper one ion, and the lead two ion. Those will all be insoluble. They will form your precipitates. Everything else will form soluble compounds and will dissolve in water. Your sulfates, they will all be soluble except for those that are with calcium, strontium, barium, silver, and lead. The mercury two or mercury one sulfate ion uh, is also very very slightly soluble so you can treat it as being insoluble as well because again maybe one gram out of a hundred would dissolve so just kind of add in the hg2 so4 for that one as well pretty much for all your other ones they're going to be insoluble you have your carbonates your chromates your phosphates, they're all going to be insoluble unless they're combined with one of the alkali metals or the ammonium ion. Sulfides are going to be insoluble with the exception of some of the group two metals. So calcium, strontium, barium, those would be soluble with your sulfides, but virtually everything else besides your group one metals would become insoluble. 
And finally, your hydroxide ions. Again, uh, they are going to be insoluble except for your heavier group twos. So those would be calcium, strontium, and barium. Those would be slightly soluble. Again, um, you're going to see much more of the solid than you would the dissolved ions, but there is enough so that we can classify them as being soluble. So let's now take a moment to just kind of practice a little bit how we would identify whether or not a compound would be able to dissolve in water. Again, using our rules here, I have calcium chloride as my first example. So again, I want to focus on the metal and I'm going to go to my halides. So my halides are going to be soluble unless it's with silver, mercury, lead, or copper. Since calcium is none of those, the physical state of matter would be aqueous. When I now go to my chromate ions, because the chromate ion is insoluble, we might think that it would be a solid. However, it is combined with lithium, which is always going to be aqueous. So lithium chromate would be soluble. When I go to the C, PBBr2, now again I'm looking at the bromides, so that's another one of my halides, and it forms a compound, Pb, with any of those ions being insoluble, so the PBBr2 would be a solid in solution. When I look at my next one, potassium carbonate, again my carbonates are insoluble, however potassium is always soluble, no matter what it's combined with. So it will be a aqueous ion in the solution. I look at my strontium hydroxide, again, typically insoluble. However, strontium is one of my three soluble group two metals. So therefore, the strontium hydroxide would be aqueous. I have my barium. So again, barium sulfide here for the next one. Sulfides are insoluble except when they are combined with calcium, strontium, and barium. So this would also be aqueous. My aluminum hydroxide, again, all my hydroxide ions are insoluble except for those with calcium, strontium, and barium. So the aluminum hydroxide would form a solid. All of my phosphate ions, you have PO43 minus combining with the silver. So this one would form a solid because silver is not one of the always soluble components. And finally, I have sodium sulfide. For my sulfides, they are going to be insoluble except for the calcium, strontium, and barium. However, sodium is one of our group one metals and it is always soluble. So this would also be aqueous. So as you're trying to identify things, I would really focus on the first two of your list. And if you don't see those and it's uh, not combined with either a halide or a sulfate, which are usually soluble, then you've got pretty much about a 98% chance that the compound is going to be insoluble in water. So as I mentioned previously, we have the precipitation reactions producing an insoluble compound, and it is a double replacement reaction. So I have two compounds that are aqueous to begin with, mixed together to produce a solid. So in this first example here, again, we would have AB as a compound plus CD. Notice the state of matter for each one is aqueous. And then I have the precipitate and the other aqueous compound. Please remember, just like in math, 2 plus 3 equals 3 plus 2. Both of them will turn out to be 5. So please do not make the assumption that the first compound that is after the arrow will be your precipitate. Sometimes it may be, but it does not have to be. So just always make sure that you're referencing your solubility rules to figure that out. So now let's look at the guidelines here. So again, just identify what the ions will be for each of your initial reactants and products and do your normal switch to form the new compounds. Uh, one of them typically will be insoluble or it could form a gas or water. 
But you could have some times where everything is soluble in water and you would just simply write no reaction in those cases. Um, please remember that all we're doing is swapping ions here. So we're going to be learning about oxidation reduction reactions where you have the elements changing their charge. This is not the case with your double replacement reactions. They will always keep the same charge. So as we're doing this, let's go through a couple of examples here where we can identify what the uh, solids will be for these particular reactions. So just for practice, again, I have my AB, I have my CD, and let's list out our ions. Again, magnesium, always a two plus charge, sulfate, SO4, two minus, I have sodium as a plus one and an OH minus as the hydroxide. So now when I'm forming my products, my A and my D combine together. So I'd have Mg2 plus OH minus. So that would be Mg OH parentheses two. And then I would have Na plus SO4 two minus. So I'd have Na2 and then SO4. So now looking at my solubility rules, again, I have sodium present in my compound for the Na2SO4. Sodium compounds, alkali metal, always soluble 100% of the time. So I know I can write that as the aqueous. And now when I look at my hydroxides, again, the hydroxides, group one metals, and your heavier group twos, calcium, strontium, and barium. So magnesium just barely misses the cut. So therefore, it would be the solid precipitate for this reaction. So now let's look at our next one. Again, I have calcium bromide plus silver nitrate. So let's get our ions set. So calcium two plus, bromide one minus. I have silver one plus and nitrate one minus. So as I'm going through this product formation, I have the Ca2 plus combining with the NO3 two minus. So I'd have Ca NO3 parentheses two. And then I have Ag plus Br minus. So I'd have Ag Br. From my solubility rules, all of my nitrate compounds, acetates, chlorates, perchlorates, always soluble 100% of the time. So I know that I would have aqueous for the calcium nitrate. For the bromine, for that bromide ion, again, a halide, we have silver, mercury, lead, and copper. Kind of think about your cup sizes, small, medium, and large. Cup gives you the copper, small, silver, medium, mercury, large, lead. So I know that this would form my precipitate, AGBR. As we look at our next one, we have lithium phosphate, strontium nitrate. So now, getting my ions together, I have Li plus, I have PO4 three minus, Sr2 plus, and NO3 minus. So my lithium will combine with the nitrate. So one plus, one minus. I would just simply have LiNO3. And then for the strontium phosphate, Sr2 plus, PO4 three minus, I would have Sr3, PO4 parentheses two. Alkali metal, nitrate, both of them always soluble. So that would be the aqueous. Strontium phosphate, all of my phosphates are going to be insoluble except for the group one metals and the ammonium ion. So strontium phosphate would be my precipitate. And finally, my last one, I have K2CO3 plus NaNO3. So now thinking about my ions here, again, I have K plus CO3 two minus, Na plus NO3 minus. You may have guessed it. I would have the KNO3 and the Na2CO3. However, both of these compounds contain alkali metals. So each one would always be soluble. So in this case, having nothing that would precipitate, everything staying aqueous, I would have a no reaction for this last problem. So the next type of reaction is going to form water. And this is what we 
call a neutralization reaction. In this case, we have an acid reacting with a base. As we know, an acid is a substance that will release hydrogen ions in water. So again, it has the hydrogen in front reacting with the anion for the acid. All of our bases are going to be substances that produce hydroxide ions in solution. And so we have the reaction of the H plus ion plus the OH minus ion forming water. And then we have the salt that's left over from the reaction between the anion for the acid and the cation for the base. So we have a general reaction form. We have HX, where X again is our anion for the acid, plus BOH, the B is the metal for the base, forming water and a salt. You will always have this as a special type of reaction where the acid and the base will always produce a salt and water. Uh, it does not matter if the salt produced is soluble or insoluble since the water forming means that the reaction is always going to occur. So a lot of times these reactions will always be aqueous in the solution, but they still actually will take place. So same type of principle is involved. We want to just simply use our general form to predict the products and see which of the substances will form for the products and just using our ions to determine what is present. If there is a insoluble compound that forms, that's fine too. We just place it as a solid. Otherwise, they'll be aqueous for the solutions. So as we look at our first example here, we're going to take our ions and we have H plus, Cl minus, Na plus, and OH minus. So I have the hydrogen as my A, chlorine as my B, sodium as my C, and the hydroxide as my D. So again, forming the A and D, that would be my water, H2O, and that we can use as a liquid. And then we have the Na. Cl, again, Na plus Cl minus, and we know because sodium is an alkali metal, 100% of the time, always soluble, so it would be Aq. So if we look at our second example. I have sulfuric acid, H2SO4 plus KOH. So in this situation, for my ions, I have H plus SO4 2 minus, K plus and OH minus. So my products that form again would be water and that would be a liquid. And then I have K plus and SO4 2 minus. So that would be K2 SO4. This is always soluble because of the potassium being an alkali metal. And so I have an aqueous product. For the balancing, you'll notice I have one potassium as a reactant. I have two as a product, so I need to have two for the KOHs. And then I have a total of four hydrogens versus two on the product side, so I'd have a two for the waters as well. In our third example, we have a solution of phosphoric acid reacting with barium hydroxide. So same thing. Let's write our ions out. I have H+. Plus, PO4 3 minus, BA2 plus, and OH minus. So I'd have the H and the OH combining together to form the water. And then I would have BA2 plus, PO4 3 minus. So I'd have BA3, PO4, parentheses 2. Our phosphates are typically insoluble unless they are found with an alkali metal or ammonium. So that would be a solid. So we would actually see a precipitate forming in this reaction. So for the balancing part, I have three bariums versus one barium on the reactant side. So I'd have a three for the coefficient of barium hydroxide. I have two phosphates for barium phosphate versus one for the phosphoric acid. So I'll have a two here. And now I have a total of six oxygens versus one. I have six hydrogens plus six more hydrogens for a total of 12. So when I have six for the coefficient of water. And for our last example, I have HClO4 perchloric acid forming with aluminum hydroxide. 
And when we look at our ions for this particular reaction, again, H plus, ClO4 1 minus, Al3 plus, and OH minus, my products, I would have the H2O, and my aluminum chlorate, I will have Al parentheses ClO4 3, because again, I have 3 plus and 1 minus. So now looking at my solubility rules, Again, the oops, that should be a liquid up here. My aluminum perchlorate always soluble, so that would be aqueous. And now for the balance. When I look at this, I have one chlorate versus three chlorates, so that would give me three for the number of hydrogens here, plus three more for a total of six. I have three atoms of oxygen, so I'd have three units of water as well. And there's our balance. We're now going to focus on an exception to the double replacement reactions in which we have a gas that is evolved or produced from a chemical reaction that involves an acid reacting with a salt. So slightly different, it can still be an acid-base reaction because the salt can be basic, but what you need to watch out for is either carbonic acid, H2CO3, or sulfurous acid, which is H2SO3, being produced from the reaction. If you have those two substances that will react together um, and form those products, you will find that the carbonic acid or the sulfurous acid will automatically decompose into water and a gas. So if you think about the H2SO3, if we remove water from that, I would be left with SO2. So you'd see SO2 gas and H2O gas being produced, whereas with the carbonic acid, if we remove the water, I'd be left with CO2. So in this type of situation here, we're going to form three products instead of two. I'm going to have the salt that will still form. So again, looking at this for sodium, uh, hydrochloric acid, H, uh, that would give me HCl plus the NaCO3. I would have CD in this case here. It's not going to follow the normal pattern. Again, the Na will combine with the Cl minus, so I will get the NaCl. But when the carbonic acid forms, hopefully this will trigger in your brain that this will automatically decompose. And so it would go to H2O and CO2. So my final answer, I would have Na plus plus H2O, or sorry, NaCl, excuse me, plus H2O plus CO2. This one here I'd have as the liquid, this would be the gas, and this would be the aqueous solution. It does the same thing again, either with bicarbonates, where you'll produce the uh, water and the carbon dioxide gas, or your sulfites, again, producing sulfur dioxide gas. So let's look at a couple of examples here, just so you can make sure that you understand how it's working out. So when I look at the example 1A, I have nitric acid, HNO3 plus the calcium carbonate, that's chalk or limestone if you're familiar with that. And we're going to now predict the products. So we're going to do the same thing. We need to look at our ions. So again, I have H plus the nitrate NO3 1 minus. I have Ca2 plus and I have the CO3 2 minus. So in this case, again, 2 plus 1 minus for the calcium nitrate, I would have Ca. NO3 parentheses 2, and that is a completely soluble compound. So I would have AQ for it. And then the carbonic acid H2 and CO3 would immediately decompose into water and carbon dioxide gas. If we look at our second example, we have sulfuric acid reacting with potassium bicarbonate or potassium hydrogen carbonate, depending on your polyatomic ion sheet. But we would have H plus SO4 2 minus K plus and then HCO3 1 minus. So forming my products, potassium sulfate, again, K2SO4 2 plus 1 minus, 
or sorry, two minus one plus. Potassium alkali metal will always be aqueous. And then from here, because it's the bicarbonate reacting with the hydrogen ion, again, I'm forming H2CO3. And so that would break down into water and carbon dioxide gas. So now in my last example, I have perchloric acid reacting with calcium bicarbonate. So my ions once more, I have H plus, ClO4 minus, Ca2 plus, and HCO3 minus. So my products in this case, I would have the H2O, I would have the CO2, oops, and I would have the Ca, ClO4, parentheses 2, for the calcium chlorate, perchlorate. This perchlorate always soluble, so it would be Aq, and then I'd have my gas and my liquid. Okay. Now, as I said, if you have a double replacement reaction that is producing the NH4OH, it will break down into ammonia gas, NH3, and then water. So if we look at our double replacement reaction, again, between the ammonium sulfate and the potassium hydroxide, looking at my ions once more, I have NH4 with a 1 plus, I have SO4 2 minus, K plus OH minus. So looking at my formulas here, I'd have the NH4 OH, one plus one minus. So I'd have that break down immediately into NH3 gas and water. And then I would have the K2 SO4. Potassium again, alkaline metal, always soluble. So I'd have K2 SO4. Next, we're going to discuss the total and net ionic equations. So the purpose of the total and net ionic equations, total is also called complete in some instances. The objective of this is to really show what is taking place within the reaction vessel. So trying to focus it on an atomic or a molecular level. When we look at that molecular equation, that is just giving us a broad overview of what is taking place, telling us all the different ions that are present within the reaction. But then the complete and the net ionic equations will actually identify what is creating the precipitate, what is creating the gas that's being evolved, what is creating the water molecules within that acid-base neutralization. So we have to focus on the type of compounds that are being uh, produced in the solution and look at something that we call that dissociation equation. When we make the solution, we are taking the solid substance, again, that is called dissociation, and as the dissolving occurs, it's going to split them into their individual ions within the solution. So when we look at the major species that are present in the solution, it's just the actual individual ions. We call those hydrated ions. So to write that dissociation equation, I would write the solid form of the ionic compound as a reactant, always the solid. I would have water being listed over the arrow. In this case, the formatting kind of messed up on me here, so my apologies on that. So I'd have the hydrogen written above, or water written above the arrow, and then it's going to produce my number of ions that are present for the compound. Again, the subscript that we would use for the compound is going to become a coefficient because it's changing into an individual number of ions. So we wouldn't say Na plus and then a three as the subscript. We would write three and then the Na plus as a coefficient. So I'd have my two ions. Both of them become aqueous in the products. So again, they're always going to be solids as the reactants. We place water over the arrow, and then they become aqueous for the products. You'll notice here with the NH43PO4, notice I have three of the ammonium ions, so I don't have just NH4 plus in parentheses three. I place the three out in front as the coefficient. So the next thing we just have to recognize, we discussed weak acids versus strong acids a little bit back in our bonding unit when we we're doing electrolytes. So just remember for your strong acids, 
Again, they will completely dissociate or ionize. So when we talk about them, they will always react with the water to produce H3O+. So if I had HCl and I just write the H2O, it is going to react to form the hydronium ion. So I'd have H3O+, and then I would have the Cl- ion. So this would completely dissociate 100% of the hydrochloric acid molecules would become hydronium ions and chloride ions. If I have a weak acid, they're going to remain mostly as the compounds. So maybe 2% of those molecules will split apart. So as a result, we just simply keep them written together as the molecule. So if I had the HNO2 nitrous acid, that is an example of a weak acid. Instead of breaking that up into H plus and NO2 minus, if this were a liquid initially, we would just write it as HNO2 aqueous as that product. Okay. So again, acids will always produce that hydronium ion, H3O plus. The H plus just simply reacts with the water to become another polyatomic ion, H3O plus. So you can kind of see here in the little diagram for our solution where I have my strong acid, which again is a strong electrolyte. We did this in class where you see the light bulb lighting up to a great extent. I have my positively charged hydronium ion, the H3O+, and then I have the hydrated ions, in this case the Cl- ion, chloride ion, being the green ones here, and they are just all surrounded by the hydrogens from the water. So I have the different ions completely separated out. You'll notice I have no hydrochloric acid molecules together. They're always separated. Whereas if I come over here for acetic acid, that's vinegar, it is a weak electrolyte. So you can see I have a very small current that's produced. So I have a very weak flicker of the light bulb. You can see I have some large acetic acid molecules right here and right here. And then I have a few of the molecules just separating out into acetate ions and the hydronium ions. So you can see we have a few of those that would be present here uh, within that solution. It's a little hard to see, but I think that's one right here for the hydronium. So you have the majority of the molecules staying together as the acid molecules. A couple of them will split up into their ions. Okay, so if we take a look at what is taking place within these solutions when we have a reaction, uh, again, the process of dissociation, producing ions when that compound dissolves in water. So a lot of times the beginning reactants are just inferring that the dissociation has already taken place. So you'll notice I have the aqueous right here and right here. That's just telling us that we've already taken those solids and dissolved them in water. So you'll notice here when I have the potassium chromate, I would have the ions separate out. So I would have two atoms of potassium and one chromate ion that would be present. Again, noticing my chemical formula, K2CrO4. That makes sense. Two potassium ions, one chromate ion to balance out the charges. Same thing, barium nitrate. I have Ba2+, and then I have the two NO3 minuses that would be in the solution. So now thinking about my reaction for the products, I know that I would have KNO3, and I would have BA and O, I'm oh, sorry, BACRO4. And I should rewrite that because there will be no parentheses. And from my solubility rules, all chromates are going to be insoluble except for the alkaline metals and ammonium. So barium will be a solid. So what I would find is that I would have a precipitate that would form on the bottom. That would be the BACRO4 as a solid. And then I would have inside of my solution potassium and nitrate ions, two for each for my balanced equation. 
Okay, so let's just look at a few examples here where we have our strong acids or ionic compounds and what they would look like in the solution. So for my first one, I have HI, which is aqueous. So again, strong acid that would split up into H plus and I minus ions. For strontium hydroxide, again, that is a strong base, but it's also an ionic compound. So I'd have SR2 plus, and I would have two OH minuses based on the chemical formula. For zinc sulfate, I have one ion of each. So I'd have ZN2 plus, and I would have SO4 two minus. I would have for aluminum nitrate, AL with a three plus charge. And then I would have three nitrate ions to balance out the charge. For nitric acid, another strong acid, I'd have H plus and NO3 minus. And then finally, as we said in the previous slide, I'd have NH4 plus and I would have three of them. And then I'd have one PO43 minus. So the last couple slides here, we're going to work our way through a couple of different example problems. So for our net ionic equations, just trying to identify what they are and how we write them, we're just going to kind of take this through as a step-by-step -step process so you can kind of see what's taking place. So again, that molecular equation, that's the broadest of all these different equations, and it's just going to show us the players on the field, what is actually reacting together, and then we start to get a little bit more specific information with our total or our complete ionic equation. This is going to show us the individual ions, the strong electrolytes that are present in the solution. Again, all the solids, liquids, gases, and weak electrolytes would remain intact. So again, only the strong electrolytes would split apart. We have our spectator ions, which is a new term. And the spectator ions are going to be those substances that do not actually react to form the solid or the liquid or the weak electrolytes or the gases. So you're going to see those appearing on the opposite sides of the reaction in their identical form. So it appears as if there is no change. Think about like any type of sporting event. You're watching the players on the field and you have spectators in the stands that are not doing anything. So the substances that stay identical on each side and can be canceled off, those are the spectators. And then you have your net ionic equation, which is only showing what is truly reacting to form the new substances. So this would be everything except for the spectator ions. So it follows the same type of concept. We want to write out our total ionic equation, our net ionic equation, and we can also write our dissociation equations for these different reactions. Now, I'm going to take it and just kind of break it up into some steps here. I'm just going to show you the net ionic and the total ionic for this slide, and then we'll incorporate the dissociation equations into the mix on the next one. So as we look at nitric acid plus barium hydroxide forming water and barium nitrate, again, you'll notice I have an aqueous substance that is forming, so that is not going to form a solid or a gas or a liquid. So those are going to be the ones that are going to be involving our spectator ions. When I have the nitric acid, I would have the H plus and I would have the NO3 minus. These would both be aqueous for the state of matter. I would have the barium aqueous with a two plus charge. I would have the two OH minuses. That would be aqueous. And I'm going to put a 2 and a 2 here for the balance equation. We need to balance that first. So I'd have that. And then for my products, I would have the two H2Os as a liquid. I would have the Ba2 plus aqueous. And I'd have the 2 NO3 minus aqueous. So hopefully you can see when we look at this reaction, I have the two NO3 minuses. They are identical on each side of the arrow. I have the two Ba2 pluses that are also identical on each side of the arrow. So my spectator ions are going to be what is underlined in the solution. And so my net ionic equation would represent everything else as present. So I'd have the H plus, I'd have the OH minus, 
and I'd have the water that would be forming. So my net ionic, I'd have 2H plus aqueous plus the 2OH minus aqueous forming the two units of water. If we were to look at this from a picture standpoint, I would have the H plus and the NO3 minuses. Again, I'm going to draw out two for that balanced equation. I would have the barium hydroxide, so I'd have Ba2 plus, and I would have two OH minuses. And then on my product side, I would have the two waters, and then I would have the Ba2 plus and the NO3 minus that would be left in the solution. Okay, so for our next problem, we're going to incorporate the dissociation equation into our process. So for this reaction, again, the one you saw in class the other day, we have potassium iodide reacting with the lead to nitrate, forming lead to iodide and potassium nitrate. From a balancing standpoint, I'm going to have the two for potassium iodide and the two for potassium nitrate. So again, the dissociation equation is just showing us what is going to take place within these uh, solutions when the compounds are dissolved in water. So I would take, even though it says Ki as aqueous, I'm going to take that and place it as a solid, place water over the arrow, and I would have 2K plus and 2I minus for my products of the first one. Again, both of these would be aqueous. And then I would have the PB and O3 parentheses 2 as a solid. H2O over the arrow. I have only one PB2 plus, which would be aqueous. And I have two NO3 minuses, which would be aqueous. It tells us that the solid that forms is the lead to iodide. So I would take the 2K plus aqueous plus the 2I minus aqueous plus the PB2 plus and the 2NO3 minus aqueous ions. Again, essentially all of my products for the dissociation equation will represent the reactions that I would list out for the total ionic equation. So I have my arrow. I would have the PBI2 that would form as the solid. And then I have the 2Ki, or sorry, the 2K pluses, which would be aqueous, and the 2NO3 minus, which would be aqueous as well. So underlining my spectators, again, I have the K plus and the K plus, the NO3 minus, NO3 minus. So for my net ionic equation, I'd have the 2I minus aqueous plus the PB2 plus aqueous forming the PBI2 as a solid. So in my container, I'd have the, sorry, that looks too much like an I, I'd have the Ks here and I would have the I's for the I minuses. I would have the PB2 plus and the NO3 minuses. I can fiddle with the color a little bit here. And I would have in the bottom, that would be my PBI2, which we would see is that pretty yellow solid. And then I would have the K plus and the NO3 minus ions that will be found in the solution. All right, so let's look at our next example. We have LIBR reacting, reacting with FeNO3 parentheses 3. It is going to form FeBr3 aqueous and LiNO3 aqueous. Now, in this case here, notice that both of my products, again, are aqueous. So there's going to be no change. So therefore, this would be a no reaction. But let's look from an atomic standpoint so that you can see exactly why. So if I'm looking at my lithium bromide for the dissociation equation, I'd have Li plus 
and I would have br minus, both of which are aqueous. And then I have the fe in 3 parentheses 3 as a solid. Can we place the water over the arrow? And I would have fe 3 plus aqueous and 3 and O3 minus aqueous. So inside of my solution, I would start off with Li plus and Br minus, Fe3 plus and NO3 minus. And because they're always aqueous for my products, that means that they will dissociate as well. So I'd have the Fe3 plus the Li plus, the Br minus, and the NO3 minus as well. So hopefully you can see I have no change between my reactants and products at all. And that's why we would have no reaction. Okay, so as I move on to my next example, we can start with the prediction of the products. So I have the NH43PO4 plus the CuSO4 a aqueous. So I'm going to go ahead and write the dissociation equation. Just we have the ions listed out from that. So I have the NH43PO4 as a solid. I would place that over the water and I would have the three NH4 pluses, which would be aqueous. And I would have the PO4 three minus aqueous as well. And then for the second reaction reactant, I have the copper sulfate, copper two sulfate in this case, as a solid. Again, placing the water over the arrow. Now I know that I have the SO4 with a two minus charge. And since I have a one to one ratio, I know that this would have to be Cu with a two plus charge. So I have all my ions now on the playing field. So when I create my products, again, I have my A, B, C, and D. So A and D come together. So I have ammonium sulfate. So I have the NH4 plus SO4 two minus. So I'd have NH4 parentheses two and then SO4. And I would have Cu2 plus PO4 three minus. So I'd have Cu3 PO4 parentheses two. And now to determine my solubilities, all ammonium compounds are soluble. So I know that this would be aqueous. My phosphates are insoluble except for ammonium and the group one metals, the alkali metals. So this would represent our solid. So for the total ionic equation, once we balance our equation, I need a three here for this. I would need a three here for this, and I would need a two for that. So we have that all set. So I now have a total of six NH4 pluses, and I have two PO4 three minuses. I have three copper two pluses and three SO4 two minuses. It is going to form a precipitate Cu3 PO4 parentheses two. And then I would have the NH4 plus with six and the three SO4 two minuses. Sorry, I'm running out of space here on this. Please infer the aqueous nature for that. So again, my spectators, I have the SO4 and the NH4 plus for each one. So for my net ionic equation, I'd have the two PO4 three minuses that were aqueous plus the three Cu2 pluses. And they're going to form the solid Cu PO CO3 PO4 parentheses two as the solid. So inside of this beaker, 
I'd have the NH4+, plus, NH4+, plus, NH4+, plus, and the PO4-3-, minus. I would have the Cu2+, plus, Cu2+, plus, Cu2+, plus, SO4-2-, minus, SO4-2-, minus, and SO4-2-, minus for that part of the balance. And then after mixing, again, I would have a solid that would form down here. That would be the Cu3PO4 parentheses 2. And then I would have NH4 plus. I'm just going to multiply that times 6 there um, in parentheses. No, I'm sorry, not worried about that. So I'd have the NH4 pluses here. And I would have the SO4 2 minuses. So pardon me on that. The beakers are a little small to write all that in. Okay. So that would be our next two examples. All right. So for our last set of examples, I have the reaction between phosphoric acid and potassium hydroxide. So in this case, just as a point of reference, the phosphoric acid that is a weak acid. So that means that it will stay together in its molecular form and will not dissociate. So I'd only have one substance that would dissociate, and that would be the potassium hydroxide. So I'd have that over the H2O. And then from there, I would have K plus and the OH minus ions. So those would be the only two that would dissociate. I would have for my products, again, because it's a base and an acid, this would be the case where we had the water and then the salt. So I'd have K3PO4, again, K plus PO4, 3 minus to give me that formula. Alkali metal, always soluble. And then I'd have the liquid for the water. From a balancing standpoint, I need three potassiums. So I would have three waters and three potassium hydroxides. So there will be my balanced equation. So now when I look at my total, the big difference, because this is a weak acid, again, it does not dissociate. So instead of splitting it up into H plus and PO4 three minus ions, I'm just going to leave it together as that H3PO4, and we just write aqueous for it. I would split the 3K pluses and the 3OH minuses. It is going to form the three units of water, and then I would have the 3K pluses and the 3PO4 three minuses. Okay, and then for my net ionic equation, hopefully you notice the only thing that remains the same on each side are the K pluses. So for my net ionic, I would have H3PO4 aqueous plus the three OH minuses aqueous forming the three waters plus the PO4 three minus aqueous. Okay, so just slightly different. So again, because of the fact that the H3PO4 is that weak acid, it's only a weak electrolyte and not a strong electrolyte, so it's not going to dissociate completely. So we're going to keep it together as that parent molecule. So inside of the flask or the beaker here, I would just have the H3PO4. I would have K plus and OH minus. Again, for this one, I think I have enough size of the beaker to write in all the ions. And then after the mixing, I would have K plus, K plus, K plus, one PO4, three minus, and three units of water. If you can see that, sorry, it's a little messy. Okay, so one last one and then we're done. So for this, I'm now looking at an example for a single replacement reaction. So it doesn't matter. We typically in the first year class only focus on the reactions that are double replacement, but technically anything that has aqueous ions involved in it could be a net ionic equation. So I just wanted to end by doing one single replacement reaction where this would take place. So 
Obviously, for that dissociation equation, I can only focus on the silver nitrate. So I'd have the AgNO3 as a solid. I have the water over the arrow, and that would produce Ag plus aqueous and NO3 minus aqueous. And now for the total ionic equation, we need to predict our products first. So again, thinking my activity series, zinc is more reactive than silver, so the reaction does take place. Zinc is a 2 plus charge, so I'd have Zn, NO3 is a 1 minus. So I'd have NO3 parentheses 2, that is aqueous because again all nitrates are soluble, and then I would have silver metal that would form as a result. So now when I would do this, my total, I'd have the Zn as a solid, I have 2 for the silver nitrate and 2 for the silver for the balance equation, so I'd have 2 Ag plus, let me do that for these in here, 2 for the Ag plus, 2 for the NO3 minus. On my product side, I have Zn2 plus plus 2 NO3 minus plus 2 solid silvers. So now my spectator ions, you'll hopefully notice I have the two different NO3 minuses, everything else. Again, there is a difference. Notice here the zinc is 2 plus with an aqueous versus zinc with a zero charge and as a solid. Same thing, two Ag pluses, aqueous, two Ags as a solid with zero. So again, differences between those two. This is a solid, this is a dissolved ion. So they're different even though it doesn't appear that there's much difference, there is a big difference in how that would look. So for my net ionic equation, I would just have the solid zinc, I'd have the two silver ions, and that is going to form the zinc 2 plus ion plus two oops, solid silvers. So that would just be Ag. Okay, so inside I would just have the little Zn as a solid that would be down here at the bottom. I would add in the two Ag pluses and the NO3 minuses. And then here I would have the solid silver down at the bottom. And I would have a Zn2 plus ion and those two nitrate ions present within the solution. All right, so that finishes up the video for today. Uh, we will again look at a few of these practice problems in class and we'll move on to balancing redox reactions next.